Westfield Sports Centre, can I help you? Yes, I hope so. I've recently moved to the area and I want to do some sports activities. Well, we have excellent facilities, including a new gymnasium and several tennis courts. Our tennis team are always looking for new people. Oh, I was never any good at gymnastics, and I don't think I've got the time to put into learning tennis. Um, no, I'm more interested in swimming, and I'd also like to take a few yoga classes if I can. OK, well, we have three swimming pools, an Olympic-size 50-metre pool and a 25-metre pool, uh, which are both outdoors, and a heated indoor pool, which is just 15 metres long, uh, but is very popular with our members in the winter. I bet it is. Do members have to pay to use the pools? Well, members don't pay for the pools if they just want to swim laps on their own. We even offer complimentary classes for beginners, but we do charge a small fee if you want to take part in the advanced training sessions. And there's also a fee for our water-based Keep Fit class. Right. And would I need to book any of the facilities, or can I just come whenever I want? We don't actually allow anyone to book the swimming lanes or the gym equipment, but for safety reasons, we can only have a maximum of seven people in the sauna at any one time, so you do need to put your name on the list for that. Fine. Now, I'd also really like to take a yoga class. Do you have any? Yes, there are classes on Monday, Tuesday and Friday in the morning from 10 till 11 and then every Saturday and Sunday in the evening. Those classes are a bit longer, starting at 6 and finishing at 7.30. Right, I'll just make a note of that. So, does that mean that if I enrol, I can come on each of those days? No, each day is a different level, so you only come once a week. Oh, I see. Well, I've been doing yoga for a little while now, but I am still finding it quite difficult. Which level do you think I should choose? Most people start at the lowest level, and then you can talk to the instructor about changing if you think it's too easy. OK. How much are the classes? They're £1.50 an hour for members. Great. Now, I'd like to come in and look at the facilities. Would someone be able to show me around? Yes, no problem. Who should I ask for? Ask for me. My name is John Doherty. That's D-O-H-E-R-T-Y. And should I just ask for you at the reception? Actually, my office is on a different level. Take the lift up to level one and you'll see my name on the door right in front of you. Great. Um, I'd like to come tomorrow, if that's OK. What time suits you? Well, I have appointments from 9 to 10.30, so could you make it 11? I'm sure that will be fine. But can I just take your direct number in case something else crops up? <laughs> that's a good idea. My number's 0117-965-478. Great. I think that's everything, so I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, my name's Alison Martin, by the way. Thanks, Alison. See you tomorrow. You will hear a trainer giving a talk to people who want to learn outdoor survival skills. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning, everyone. 
and welcome to our outdoor survival program. As you know, this week you'll be learning some of the basic information and skills you need to look after yourself independently in the outdoors. These first two days, we'll be based here in the classroom, and then we'll be taking a camping trip to put into practice some of the things you've learned. I'm going to start off with the topic of food. And to start with, I'll describe just two methods which we'll be putting into practice at our camp and which make use of natural resources, the steam pit and the bamboo pot. I've got two posters here to make things clearer, and I'll start with the steam pit here. To make this, you'll need some dry sticks, some grass, some loose earth, and some stones. And for this week only, some matches. <laughs> the first thing you do is to dig a shallow pit in the place you've chosen to do your cooking. Let's say about 25 centimeters deep and 30 centimeters wide. Your sticks have to be a bit wider than the pit because you have to put a line of them along the top from one end of the pit to the other. Before setting light to these, you take some large stones and arrange them on top. Then you start the fire and wait till the wooden platform burns through and the stones fall into the pit. At this point, brush away any pieces of hot ash from the stones. You can use a handful of grass and then take another stick and push it down into the center of the pit between the stones. After that, you cover the whole pit with a thick layer of grass. And then you can put your food on it, wrapped in more pieces of grass, like parcels. Finally, cover the whole thing with earth. You have to pat it firmly to seal the pit. Then all you have to do is take the stick out and pour a bit of water into the opening that it leaves. It should take about four hours for your food to cook as it cooks slowly in the steam that's created inside the pit. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So, simple but effective. The other method you're going to practice this week is the bamboo oven. Now the steam pit is ideal in certain conditions because the heat is below ground level. For example, if there's a strong wind and you're afraid a fire might spread. But when it's safe to have an open fire, you can use the bamboo oven method. You get a length of bamboo, which, as you probably know, is hollow and consists of a number of individual sections with a wall in between. You use a sharp stick to make a hole in each of the dividing walls apart from the end one. Then you lean the bamboo over a fire with the top propped up by a forked stick and the bottom sitting on the ground. You pour enough water in the top to fill the bottom section and then light a fire underneath that section to heat the water. Then you put your food inside the top section and the steam coming up the bamboo through the holes you made cooks it. I'm going to move on now to food itself and talk about some of the wild plants you might cook. I'm going to begin with fungi. That's mushrooms and toads. I'm sure you'll be aware that some of these are edible and they're delicious, but some of them are highly poisonous. Now, whether they're poisonous or not, all fungi that you find in the wild should be cooked before eating because that helps to destroy any compounds in them that might be mildly toxic. But be aware that any amount of cooking won't make poisonous varieties any safer to eat. Unless you can definitely identify a fungus, you should never eat it. 
it's not worth the risk. And you need to be really sure because some fungi that are poisonous are very similar in appearance to certain edible varieties. They can easily be mistaken for each other. So having said all that, fungi are delicious when they're freshly picked. And although they are only moderately nutritious, they do contain minerals which the body needs. I'll move on now to leafy plants, which are generally... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You're going to hear a university tutor interviewing a candidate for a place on a postgraduate diploma course in teaching geography. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully to the first part of the interview and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello. Jonathan Briggs, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Do come in and sit down. Thanks. Right. Well, Jonathan, as we explained in your letter, in this part of the interview we like to talk through your application form, your experience to date, etc., and then in the second part, you go for a group interview. Group interview, yes, I understand. So, your first degree was in economics? Yes, but I also did politics as a major strand. Mm -hmm. And you graduated in 1989. And I see you've been doing some teaching. Yes, I worked as a volunteer teacher in West Africa. I was there for almost three years in total, from... 1992 um, 1992. How interesting. What organisation was that with? It's not one of the major ones. It's called Teach South. Oh, right. Yes, I have heard of it. It operates in several African countries, doesn't it? And what kind of school was it? A rural cooperative. Oh, a rural cooperative. How interesting. And what did you teach? A variety of things in different years. Um... I did, with forms one to three, mainly geography, and some English with form five. Then, in my final year, I took on some agricultural science with the top year. That's form six. Right. Quite a variety, then. I also ran the school farm. How interesting. Before the interview continues, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 28 to 30. And how did you find the whole experience? I'll be honest with you. At the end of the first year, I really wanted to leave and come home. Oh, why was that? Well, 
I was very homesick at first and missed my family. Oh, yes, I can understand that. And I also found it frustrating to have so few teaching resources. But I did decide to stay, and in the end I extended my tour to a third year. Right. Things must have looked up then. Yes, we set up a very successful project, breeding cattle to sell locally. Really? And then, after a lot of hard work, we finally got funds for new farm buildings. And you wanted to see things through? Uh-huh. And that's why you want to train to teach geography? Yes. I've had a couple of jobs since then, but I now realise I like teaching best. And I chose geography because... because it's my favourite subject. And also because I, I think it has so many useful applications. Well, you certainly have had some interesting work experience. I'll ask you now to go on to the next stage of the interview. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. On page 113. Section 4. You will hear a presentation by a student about a website she has designed for a supermarket. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 113 and 114. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. For my website design project, I decided to approach SuperSave supermarkets because I have an evening job at the supermarket, so I already have a slight insight into their organisational goals and workings. The field research for my project was in two stages. First, I had an interview with Mr Dunn, who is in charge of SuperSave's customer care department. I discussed the project with him in order to identify the supermarket's requirements. Mr Dunn said customers are often unwilling to make a face-to-face -face complaint when they've experienced difficulties with a product or a member of staff or anything related to the supermarket. So he said a website which allowed members of the public to get in touch with the organisation and bring the problem to their attention in a private manner might be very useful. And we agreed that I'd work on this. For the second stage of my research, I devised a questionnaire to put to SuperSave customers. I needed to find out about the customers' experiences of problems together with their attitudes towards making complaints, both directly and indirectly. I used a mixture of closed questions such as have you ever experienced a problem at any super safe store and open questions such as what would you find helpful about a customer complaint website. I decided to do interviews rather than rely on distribution of the questionnaire as I felt this was likely to lead to a higher take-up rate. I visited four super safe stores two in the city centre and two in the outskirts, and altogether I interviewed 101 respondents. Then finally, I analysed the results. I found the results of the questionnaires to be very informative. I found that out of the total number of customers investigated, 64% had at some stage encountered a problem in a super safe store. 
Out of these people, the vast majority said that they hadn't reported the problem to any member of staff. They just kept it to themselves. The next thing I tried to find out was why they hadn't complained. Well, about 25% of the people I interviewed said the reason was that they couldn't be bothered, and a slightly smaller percentage said that they didn't have enough time. But 55% said the reason was that they felt intimidated. I finally asked if they would be more likely to complain if they didn't have to do it face to face, and nearly everyone I asked said that they would, 95% to be exact. I then set about designing the website to meet these needs. Once I'd completed the website, I made another appointment with Mr. Dunn to find out what he thought of it. Mr. Dunn said he felt that the pages would benefit his organisation by giving customers a new way of expressing their complaints and by making it easier to collect complaints, identify specific places where service and customer care were not as good as they should be and act upon them accordingly. Supersave is already a highly customer-orientated organisation and he thought our website would be an excellent addition to their customer care effort. This is all well and good, but there still remains the general problem with websites, that there's a lack of access to online computers. Surprisingly, in my survey, I found that 88% of those interviewed had access to the internet, which I felt was quite high. But this access wasn't always direct. For some people, it was through their children and grandchildren and neighbours and so on, rather than being readily available in their own homes. This could prove to be a major drawback to the site, but it is still better to have it now to get the edge over competitors, however slight, and in the very near future, it is expected that almost everyone will have direct access to the internet. Another thing to consider is that at the moment I can only base our conclusions on data gathered from a tiny fraction of the supermarket's customer base. In order to get a better idea of how the site is doing and to see how well I have met my objectives, the site will need to have been up and running for at least a few months. After this time, it'll be possible to see whether or not people are actually using the site and if it's helping to make improvements to their customer service. It would also be interesting to study the effect of the site on staff at the supermarket, Morale could be dented as more complaints come in. Staff may feel they are being unfairly criticised and that there is no need for another way for customers to complain. But also, the site could boost morale by making staff come together to overcome the constructive criticism and they may gain more job satisfaction by knowing that they are making a difference to the customer. So, overall, I feel my website has met my objectives but there is scope for improvement and expansion. Are there any questions? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.